morning, everyone. Today is March 24th, 2022, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food project founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in spring of 2020. Every week, every Thursday, Jean Lawler and I are delighted to host another cutting edge webinar. There's of course no charge for these great webinars. Rather, we ask you to contribute to a food bank if you like what you see. And so far, our audiences have been so exceptionally generous in contributing in honor of the great speakers who have presented on the program. One of my favorite parts of the program every week is when we announce the running total of just how much our generous audiences have contributed. Jean Lawler, would you please do the honors? Hello, Jeff. Hello, everyone. Um, so this week we are, we're up to an amazing $255,102.50, as in five zero cents. And so that's about 3 million meals, um, give or take. And that's just fantastic. Thank you all. And um, thank you to our speakers so much. That is just wonderful. And we have two more great speakers today who I'm delighted to announce, Dr. Edward Brodkin and Ashley Palatra. They are the authors of a terrific book, which we'll hold up here and plug. It's called Missing Each Other. And uh, let me introduce them by reading from the book flap. Dr. Edward S. Ted Brodkin is Associate Professor of Psychiatry with tenure at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the founder and director of the Adult Autism Spectrum Program at Penn Medicine. His research focuses on social neuroscience and the autism spectrum in adults. Ashley Palathra, MA, is a therapist and clinical researcher. She's currently pursuing her PhD in clinical psychology at the Catholic University of America. She's the author of numerous published research articles in the fields of resilience, and social emotional functioning in youth, autism research, and social neuroscience. And I can tell you, this book is just terrific. Uh, the algorithms told me that I would like it, and the algorithm was right. I learned a lot from this book, and the general theme is attunement and how we get on wavelength with other people. It's a subject that's critically important to us as mediators and negotiators because we have to establish rapport and get on wavelength with people very fast, people whom we've never met before. So I thought it would be a great idea to have Ted and Ashley present to us on the subject. Ashley, Ted, we'd love to have you tell us a little bit about the food bank, where you'd like people to direct contributions if they're in a position to do so, and then talk to us about attunement. Friends, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. It's really wonderful to be here with you all, um, especially with this important mission. And so we're really excited to be able to share our work with you today. Um, and also, you know, hopefully get a lot of good donations for what we'll be sharing is the Share Food Program in Philadelphia. And I know we have some slides that we'll start off with in terms of talking about our work and discussing the topics at play, and then we'll definitely leave time at the end for hopefully some good conversation and discussion. And so if you wouldn't mind sharing those slides, that would be great. We can start with that. Perfect. All right, well, thank you again for those introductions. Um, just a orient you to what we were hoping for today. The Share Food Program is in Philadelphia. You know, that's uh, the city where Ted and I first started working together at the University of Pennsylvania and started our work that ended up becoming the source material for this book, Missing Each Other. Um, I'm currently a psychology resident in North Carolina for the year at the University of uh, Chapel Hill's Children's Hospital, but I will be moving back to Philadelphia in the fall. And so this is a program that has been special to me and especially in the way that they serve a lot of different types of organizations and uh, projects in terms of, you know, food banks, but also the education and advocacy. And that was really important just to improve the sustainability of this work. So we thank you in advance for your contributions. 
Um, and we will start talking about missing each other. Ted, do you wanna get us started? Yeah, thanks, Ashley. And um, many thanks again to um, Jeff and Natalie and everyone who invited us today. We're really honored. Um, <clears throat> everyone can hear me okay? Okay. So as Jeff mentioned, uh, what we're going to talk about today comes out of our book, Missing Each Other, that was published last year. Um, just a quick background on this. Um, Ashley and I were working together some number of years ago on research on the autism spectrum and trying to develop um, a program for adults on the autism spectrum to improve their social functioning. And as we worked on this, um, we, be, we began to think that some of the things we were working on were not just applicable to people on the spectrum, but really applicable to any of us, um, ourselves included. Like, how do we make better connections with each other? And, you know, we were aware of literature even before COVID that um, there were rising rates of loneliness and disconnection and atomization in our society and polarization. And it just seems harder and harder for people to be able to communicate effectively. So um, what we focused on in this book is a concept that Jeff already mentioned called attunement. So if we could go to the next slide. And this is really what we're gonna be talking about with you today. And we're hoping that this concept of attunement can be useful to you as mediators, arbitrators, et cetera. Um, so I'll give you a brief definition and maybe a slightly longer definition of attunement. Briefly, we define it as the ability to be aware of your own state of mind and body while also tuning in and connecting to another person. And a bit longer definition, we define attunement as the ability to, quote, make contact with others, not only at a thought level, but also at a gut and emotional level, and to stay in tune and in sync with both the feelings of others and one's own feelings, not just in a single moment of understanding or empathy, but over time during the somewhat unpredictable twists and turns of an interaction. Um, so that's a mouthful. I think that to bring this home, to really make it clearer, it's helpful to think about some specific examples. So if we go to the next slide. So these are just some examples of scenarios where um, we would say that attunement is at play. And if you think of that, def that brief definition of being in tune with yourself and the other person and the connection between you and what's happening between you over the twists and turns of an interaction, you'll probably see that all of these in some ways are examples of this. So on the upper left, you see a mother and baby. Um, and this is sort of the classic situation in which attunement has been studied in the psychology literature that there's this close paying attention to each other, gazing at each other, looking in each other's eyes. Um, and there's a back and forth interaction between the two, probably some cooing and things like that. At the bottom left, you see two friends chatting, having what seems like a good conversation. In the top middle, you see two musicians, a cellist and a pianist playing together, um, some closely sort of listening to each other and playing in sync with each other. Um, Below that, you see two dancers dancing together. And then on the right, you see Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen on a fast break down the court. This is for you 1990 Chicago Bulls fans out there, <laughs> among whom I count myself. But um, you can see that when you think about all these interactions, these two pairs of people really need to be paying close attention to each other over time. And each of these is a sort of a dynamic situation. Like if you think about Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, this isn't just like a single moment, cross-sectional moment in time. Like this is a highly dynamic situation as they move down the court. And they almost have to have eyes in the back of their heads, so to speak, to know where each other are and to be really tuned into each other and to the opposing um, team during this play. And one other thing I'll point, about, point out about these pictures is that uh, what we what I said earlier about attunement is that you have to be aware both of yourself and of the other person. So like if you consider the cellist and the pianist in the top middle there, each of them, like let's say the cellist, she needs to know what she's doing, right? She needs to be listening to herself, knowing what she's playing, and at the same time really listening closely to the pianist and knowing what the pianist is playing and being aware of the interaction, the sort of synchronicity between them. And when you think about it, that's an awful lot to monitor, um, but that's what goes on, you know, in, even in conversations and you can get better at it with practice. So next slide. 
so what we what I described so far mostly are friendly interactions and sort of almost loving interactions or teammate interactions. Um, what we'd also argue is that attunement, the concept of attunement is also relevant to conflictual um, interactions, which I know is something that you as mediators probably deal with all the time. Um, <clears throat> one thing is that um, in some ways attunement can break down during conflicts, right? So like if you look at this man and woman having some sort of conflict, um, you know, neither of them is probably very aware of themselves at this moment. They're, they may be almost like losing touch with themselves as they just fully get engulfed in their own anger. Um, they're not really listening to the other person. They're kind of shouting at each other or past each other, not really taking each other in um, clearly. And so in these kinds of situations, attunement can really break down. Next slide. But we're also gonna argue that um, even in conflict, attunement can be really useful for navigating conflict skillfully. And this is something that um, has been developed by martial artists. Um, martial artists who wanna be skilled in navigating conflict um, know that to really be good at this, you have to develop your skills of attunement. So if you look at these two martial artists in interaction, um, they're not like the people shouting at each other, right? They're very, they're calmer, they're aware, um, they're sensing each other. Um, in some ways they can move with each other. And so through a lot of practice and development of, of skills, they've learned to be attuned to another person even in the midst of a conflict. Next slide. So I'm gonna hand this over to Ashley in a, in a second, but um, in our book, you know, this process of attunement, you, you might say, well, this is really complicated. You know, <laughs> the intricacy of what happens between people in a conversation or musicians playing together or martial artists or whatever, like, how can you even really understand that? Um, but what we try to do in the book is break it down into parts, into components, and try to give some background on each of those components and then even give some practices, some exercises that you can use to develop each of those components. And we break it down into these four components that we call number one, relaxed awareness, number two, listening, number three, understanding, and number four, mutual responsiveness. And um, the names for these four components are deceptively sim uh, simple. Like for example, when we get to listening, you'll see it's more complicated than what you might just think of sort of plain listening. Um, so I'm gonna let Ashley take it with the next slide where we go into the first component of relaxed awareness. Sounds good, thank you, Ted. And before we jump into the individual components, I will ask that everyone just take a moment to try and call to mind a situation that you might be thinking of that might have been difficult or maybe has been difficult in the past and you wondered how could I have navigated that differently before? This could be a conflict that maybe you've come across professionally. It could even be a personal relationship, one where you feel like you continually hit a wall or are having trouble finding that way of um, seeing one another and really being in sync. And so just try to call to mind, you know, one example at least to be able to think about these different concepts as we go through them in order to think about how might they might be relevant and applicable to you and also might help facilitate a little bit easier conversation at the end in terms of thinking about questions for how this can be turned into um, you know, practical steps, because that's really the objective of our book. We've done so much research um, over our work together, but this book was really meant to really distill all of these concepts into things that people can take with them into their day and throughout their lives. So as we go into the first component, relaxed awareness, we'll go to this next slide just to give you all a definition of that. So when we think about relaxed awareness, we're thinking about um, you know, finding a real balance in terms of your mental and your physical state. That's really the foundation of attunement. It's something that is difficult to cultivate. It ebbs and flows and takes a lot of practice to re-regulate and come back to, which is why we talk about this as the foundational component. It's the one that all the other elements of attunement really rest on. And so relaxed awareness is when you're thinking about being aware of yourself and your environment, including the other people around you, while finding a way to stay calm and relaxed 
and letting go of tension. So it sounds like a lot to do. It also sounds counterintuitive in a way because when we think about being relaxed, right? You're trying to be, oftentimes we'll think about just letting everything go and not being, not focused on anything, not really thinking about the situation at hand. When you think about tension uh, or being really uh, tense, you're thinking about kind of being really focused, right? And really in it. But we're talking about finding that balance of how do you um, physically find that level of relaxation in terms of noticing where that tension is in your body as a way of becoming more focused in the situation at hand. Um, because I think to be connected to someone else, oftentimes if we are too tense or too hyper-focused, we might not be able to pick up on cues that they are generating to us. We also might not be able to you know, be fully aware of what we're trying to communicate to the other person. At the same time, if you're kind of unaware and not really focused, you might not be able to be finding common ground or um, aligning in what you're trying to communicate. And so for relaxed awareness, we're really trying to cultivate it like a muscle. It's something that we talk about that you can practice through simple exercises. Um, I think we might have some on the next slide. Well, these are, we'll come back to the examples. But if you go to one more slide, these are some of the basic examples that we talk about in the book. And you can even go ahead and try this um, yourself right now if you feel like doing it on camera or turning your camera off if you feel more comfortable. But trying to sit upright, you know, keeping your eyes open with a soft gaze, what we often do is try and suggest that people tilt their chin down, feel like the crown of their head is suspended up, feeling a gentle stretch in their neck, letting your shoulders release down and gently feeling and noticing your breath. So that'll be your belly expanding with your in-breath and relaxing with your out-breath. Trying to relax those facial muscles. A lot of us hold tension up here in our eyes without even realizing it or in your forehead or jaw. And the reason why we start with the physical is because when we are you know, in a heightened conversation or a distressing conflict, it's hard to force your mind to calm down. It's hard to force the other person to connect and, and feel aligned mentally or emotionally, right? So what we can do then is start with the physical. Start with being able to relax yourself physically as a way to generate calmness such that you can um, increase your focus. And that really sets you up for being able to then move with the twists and turns of the interaction, which we'll continue to talk with with the other components. But try and notice that as we continue with this presentation of just coming back to your breath, noticing if you find yourself getting distracted, opening up tabs, which understandably we all do, or fidgeting in your chair, you know, um, getting a sense of starting to notice those changes in yourself, I think sets you up or feeling more connected with other people. So we'll move on to the next component. All right, listening. Great. Um, so as Ashley described, relaxed awareness is that foundational state of mind and body for attunement, um, that first component of attunement that everything else is built upon. With the second component, listening, um, we want to take that state of relaxed awareness and focus it on another person and what they're communicating and also what they're eliciting in you. So um, the way we do this is we try to pay attention to the various cues that in addition to the literal meaning of the words they're saying, we're trying to um, pay attention to their tone of voice, the pauses in their speech, their facial expression, their eye contact level, um, and their body language and sort of integrate all of those um, if we go to the next slide. So, so part of listening is what I just said, is, is being open enough to take in all those cues. Um, and we're open enough so that we actually resonate with the other person in some sense. So, um, and on several levels. So on one level, it's physically. You may have noticed 
if you're having a really good conversation with someone that feels like you have a good rapport between you, um, you might notice you're sort of mimicking each other in terms of your posture, like the way you're sitting in your chair. Like if they cross their leg, you might sort of unconsciously cross your leg. So there's a physical mirroring that goes on when we're really listening closely to someone. Um, there's a verbal listening. You know, our tone of voice tends to match the other person to some extent, the word, even the words we use. And then um, there's an emotional resonance that can go on between people. So if you're talking with someone and they're looking really sad, let's say, and they're describing something really sad, you may start to feel somewhat sad yourself and, you, and recognize that it's coming from them. And that's what we call emotional empathy. So, so we're talking here about a really broad conception of listening, where we're open enough to the other person that we start to resonate with them on all these different levels. And also a reminder that listening is not just listening to the other person, but it's also trying to check in with yourself and have some awareness of how you're feeling as well. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so I'll just say really quickly that um, in these different examples, you can think of ways in which each of these pairs of people is really, in a broad sense, listening to each other. They're really taking in each other's cues, um, trying to take in the nuances of what's going on, even the each other's pacing, like with the dancers or the basketball players or the martial artists, they're, they're sensing all those things from the other person while still remaining aware of themselves. Next slide. So um, as Ashley mentioned with relaxed awareness, for each of these components in the book, we have exercises that we suggest. We can't go through all of them today. We don't have enough time, but we're just giving you a little bit of a sample of some of these exercises. So one of the um, <clears throat> listening exercises from the book, we suggest trying to find a conversation partner. It could be anyone. It could be family member, friend. Um, and you can even tell them that you're doing some listening practice. And ask your conversation partner to just talk to you for two minutes or five minutes about anything on their mind or something that happened to them that day. And then really focus on listening to them. And as you listen, try to put aside distractions. You know, we're all distracted by our phones and all kinds of things coming at us, but try to really focus on them, maintain your focus and concentration on what they're communicating with care, but not with strain and try to consider what they're saying to you just in those two minutes. Try to consider what they're saying and expressing to you to be the most important thing to you at this moment. Really prioritize it. And as you're listening to them, try to check in on yourself from time to time. Like, how are you feeling as you're listening to them? So that's an exercise that you can try. And um, we think that if you try to do this regularly. You don't even necessarily have to tell the person you're doing it. Like when you come home at the end of the day, whoever you live with and ask them about their day, really try to maintain focus on them for a couple of minutes. And the more you do it, the, the better you can get at it. I think like Ashley said, it's kind of like a muscle that you can develop. Okay, next slide. I'm gonna let Ashley talk about understanding. So for this third pillar of understanding, similar to listening, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into um, what different components can make it more difficult to understand one another. You know, we talk in the book about how there was a, um, a quote by uh, a Buddhist monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, who passed away recently. And he says, understanding and love are one and the same. And I think a lot of people can probably um, relate to that. The idea that when we feel understood by someone else, we feel seen, we feel a level of love. And I know some of you might be thinking that, you know, might be more related to our personal relationships, but I think how we can generalize that professionally is this idea that if that's the goal of most people, then the way that we can connect with others is to remember that as another's, another person's objective of just wanting to be seen and to be heard and how we can use that as um, a way of being more effective in being open and communicative and getting each other's point of view across. And so understanding overall is really trying to understand, pick up on another person's cues, understanding that their point of view 
can be and probably is different from your own. What it's like to be in their shoes is one way to think about it. Um, but there's a lot of pitfalls to understanding each other. A lot of things that get in the way. And that's going to include our own assumptions, our, our own biases of another person. Oftentimes we will make uh, almost immediate attributions of someone else, which means we will create reasons as to as, for their behavior or why they did things a certain way, right? Because as humans, our brain wants to be able to understand why people did things. We want to make sense of our world. Um, and so we try and label people in a certain way to get an understanding and make it make sense. And sometimes those attributions are accurate. Sometimes they're not. The other thing that gets in the way of understanding often is our reactivity, or maybe a difficult topic triggers us in a way and you go red, you're not able to focus back into the room and ground yourself in that conversation. It feels like either the other person or yourself, your ears just shut off and you're not able to continue, right? You hit a wall and that happens to all of us. But I think being able to come back to the relaxed awareness, the piece of being able to notice that when it's happening gives you that chance of being able to regulate in that moment. Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to control how the other person reacts, but your reactivity definitely has cascading effects on your ability to be in sync and, and communicate with someone else. One of the key points too of understanding that I think is really important when trying to understand someone else is to remember that it's always going to be incomplete. It's always going to be a work in progress, even with a relationship where you are incredibly close to, maybe your partner of uh, three decades, right? You, I think some of the best relationships talk about how you're still learning something new every day. You still have this curiosity is a genuine acceptance of the fact that what they think or what they're trying to communicate might be different than what you expect. And I think that's something to carry forward in professionally in terms of conversations with um, colleagues or clients in knowing that there is a certain level of, of curiosity that is necessary to really feel like you can accurately understand someone and also give them a sense that you are staying humble and open to that possibility of whatever they might bring to that conversation or table. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Probably will just bring up yep, these examples and then the last one or the next one. And so for this, just building on the last exercise we talked about, if you are listening to someone and practicing some of these skills in those moments of listening, trying to really imagine this other person's perspective, going a little deeper than what we probably have time for on a daily basis in the fast paced communications that we're having, you know, notice and, and cultivate that genuine interest in, you know, what is their perspective? How is it different from mine? What emotions are you sensing in them, in them, in yourself, in terms of your reaction to what they're communicating? Um, and try and be cognizant of noticing if you're having a rigid view of what they're describing in order to start building that openness um, to updating your understanding of who they are. So we'll go on to the last component of attunement, which is mutual responsiveness. Okay, and um, just to kind of recap where we are so far. So four components of attunement. Um, we talked about the first component, relaxed awareness, which is this foundational state of mind and body. Listening, in a sense, is being attentive to the cues and what's coming in and sort of resonating with the other person. Understanding is how we mentally, cognitively process those cues coming in. How do we understand them? How do we understand the other person's point of view versus our point of view? Um, and this final component, component four, mutual responsiveness, is what we actually do towards the other person. That's part of attunement. So this is kind of like the active component of attunement. And um, 
we break this down into parts, mutual responsiveness. So first we talk about meeting the other person where they are, um, then keeping your responses on target and connected in some way to what the other person just said or did, and then staying in the flow. Um, and uh, finally, learning to begin again. So if we go to the next slide, I can maybe illustrate this. Um, if we consider, I think a particularly good example for um, mutual responsiveness is the, the example of the dancers in the bottom middle. Um, because with dancing, um, if you're going to dance with someone and be attuned to your dancing partner, you literally have to meet them where they are, right? Like you have to align your body with their body uh, to start the dance. And then you have to have this um, sort of continuous back and forth adjustment of the way you're dancing. You have to sort of sense the other person during that. And finally, you have to stay in the flow. So as the music's going, you have to stay in the flow of that dance with that other person. You can't wander way off mentally or just start doing the dance that you want to do that's unconnected with your partner. You have to stay in that flow. And um, in some sense, that's analogous to conversation and the way things go in conversation. And um, this first part about meeting the other person where they are, I think that's kind of obvious when it comes to dance, um, maybe less obvious when it comes to conversation. You, you might say, well, why do, you know, why do I have to meet the other person where they are? Um, you know, why don't they meet me where I am or something like that? But I think that it can be really helpful. One, one example that I sometimes use for my own life is I have kids and um, when they were little kids and would come home at the end of the day and I would say like, how was your day at school? And they might often just say, it was fine, you know, and not tell me anything. And if I insisted that they tell me that I would get nowhere basically. But if they were engaged in some game or playing with some toy, and then I met them where they were, like I said, oh, that's a, you know, I just started meeting them where they are with whatever thing that they were playing with, and then engaged in that with them, then very quickly, all the details about their day would come spilling out. So I, there's something very effective about meeting the other person where they are to form this attuned interaction. And even, I think in your line of work as mediators or arbitrators, um, even when someone's angry about something or, you know, in the midst of a stressful situation, I think meeting them there in some way can really open up a connection um, and be really helpful. So next slide. So an exercise from our book on mutual responsiveness. So in that conversation exercise we've been talking about, um, we suggested trying out these steps. So try to initiate the conversation with the other person by meeting the other person where they are. So what's on their mind? Um, where are they mentally? Where are they emotionally? And be willing to meet them there. Um, I mean, ideally, um, you know, both people will be able to meet each other halfway. That's the ideal, right? But you can't necessarily count on the idea that the other person is going to meet you where you are. So be willing in some way to meet them where they are and respond to them in a way that's connected to what they're saying or doing. Um, so not, so you can still assert yourself in the conversation, but it's, your assertion is gonna be most effective when it's connected to what they're saying or doing. Um, think about those martial artists, right? Like one of those martial artists can assert themselves or push or do something to the other one, but it's gonna be most effective if they're pushing where the other person actually is in a way that's connected to them, not off to the side um, and then try to stay in the flow of the conversation and not wander off but if you drift off um, or lose connection try to reconnect so that's that part about beginning again you know not th these things are hard we all inevitably get distracted or wander off at some point um, so part of the skill of this is recognizing when we have wandered off and then trying to reconnect and connect again um, so next slide so um, putting it all together, just to recap, these components of relaxed awareness, listening, understanding, and mutual responsiveness. And the way we think about these is, um, you know, they're not individual isolated skills. It's more like we ultimately want to put these all together in a, in a fluid skill set. So it's 
going back to basketball for a moment, it's a little bit like you're learning dribbling and then you're learning shooting and then you're learning passing as discrete skills. But ultimately what we wanna be able to do is put them all together and function well as a player in the game. And that's how we think of these components of attunement. Next slide. Um, maybe I'll, I'll do this one quickly, Ashley, and let you do the next one. Um, so I know for you all as mediators, you're dealing a lot probably with conflictual situations. And we're going to wrap up our presentation soon. And we would love to hear you know, more from you about what kinds of situations you're encountering. Um, but you know, the, the way I imagine mediation anyway is that uh, you have people in conflict who like on this upper left here just may not be attuned at all. They may be sort of the opposite of attuned, right? They're, they're dug into their position. They're not really listening to each other. They're yelling at each other. They're not understanding each other. They're not doing any of these things that we talked about today. Um, and they're not achieving this sort of idealized way of navigating conflict that we show with the martial artists. So I think, you know, so what can you as a mediator do? Um, it, I would imagine that part of the skill or the art of being a mediator is using these kinds of attunement skills to um, tune in to both of the, you know, people in conflict and sort of trying to get a sense of and tune into and understand each of them and the differences in their positions and, um, somehow use your attunement skills to uh, lead to a productive discussion and maybe even find areas of commonality that they didn't even know existed or, or at least encouraging them to um, meet each other halfway and compromise in some way. So next slide. And I think this one, I'm gonna let Ashley take it from here. Yeah, just as Ted has been saying, it is challenging. And I think part of what we want to keep reiterating is that we're never going to reach a perfect level of attunement all the time. It comes and it goes, it breaks. Um, and I think the individual components too, the way we think about it in the book at least is, you know, we had a developed a quiz for readers to take in terms of thinking about what are the different elements that maybe are more difficult or less difficult um, in terms of the interactions that you're navigating. And so for some, maybe they do feel really skilled in their ability to hear and listen what someone is communicating to be able to interpret it well, summarize it well, um, respond back to it effectively. Maybe for you, one of the things that's getting in the way sometimes is that relaxed awareness of being able to cultivate that relaxation so as to focus better. Maybe there's times where you're easily distracted by your own internal stress or the stress of the situation that gets, um, that acts as a barrier to the other steps. Maybe it's the opposite for another person, but that's why we think about them as a little bit separate as a way to kind of focus your attention and not feel like it's one big nebulous skill that's hard to you know get better at. But I think, you know, a big thing to take away is that even just a slight change or improvement in any of these skills can have really notable impacts on your ability to attune and connect with someone else um, in an individual interaction or in a group. And I think the power of it, the effect of it, that when we do feel in sync, even in an argument, when we are able to follow one another um, and stay with one another, even when we do disagree, is pretty powerful and can be pretty moving, um, which I think, you know, helps us see how this can have such a significant impact. Our last slide, we wanted to just quickly mention, you know, and, and reflect on the ways in which this is being impacted with all of the virtual world that we're in. And so on the next slide, you know, thinking about how a lot of this work is probably continuing to be done on video, despite maybe our original thoughts that we would be more so back in person. You know, as clinicians, we think about this as well with our patients and clients in terms of building that connection over a 2D screen. And I think practically speaking, you know, some of the things to be thinking about are, you know, first and foremost, your setup. And 
your desk, your chair, your screen, facilitating in the way that allows for comfortable posture that then can facilitate your ability to practice relaxed awareness. You would, I mean, maybe it's different for this group, but you would be surprised at the number of people that I still speak to who have yet to figure out a good setup for themselves at home because they still think, um, you know, we might not have to do this forever, but I think two years in, we're realizing that it is something to invest in, especially for maybe the fields that we're in and, and can speak to. But that posture, that physical nature, it starts with that, you know, the neuroscience research tells us that our feelings and emotions are often generated by how our bodies, uh, our bodily sensations are feeling, right? So that physical input is what then generates that emotional response. And so starting with that posture can help to um, ease your ability to relax and, and stay focused. Thinking about with the camera, trying to angle in a way where you can see each other's, you know, approximate each other's eye contact, despite the fact that it won't exactly be in sync as it is in person. Keeping cameras on whenever possible, that's a tricky one, depending on your own context or situation of what's deemed the norm, but the ability to at least have that richness of seeing someone's face can really help to um, cultivate that connection, even on a screen, uh, minimizing those distractions. I know I was joking with some of the examples earlier of thinking about what's on your screen, what's around you in terms of things that might be drawing your attention away. And, you know, you might have noticed already yourself that we are becoming more sensitive to noticing nonverbal cues while on video conference. You know, it's definitely a different set of skills than what we need when we're in person and we can actually see one another and our whole bodies and our body language. But we're getting better at being able to notice darting eyes across the screen, noticing changes in uh, screen brightness, indicating things are moving or changing. Those sort of cues are, you know, being acknowledged, whether consciously or unconsciously, and can impact how you're able to connect. A couple other things to think about is just the idea of building in time as a warm up whether um, in case this is relevant, you know, when we think about meeting in a conference room for meetings and being with other people, there's always this natural time of people shuffling in, having sort of candid um, small talk. I think some people might enjoy how we open up Zoom. We open up our meetings right at 9 a.m. and we get started into business and the effect, the efficiency of that is welcome. But in other ways, I think when we're talking about connection, when we're talking about wanting to um, build the capacity to really help people feel understood and heard, you know, having some time for that wiggle room of, of warm up, I think, especially culturally speaking, can be really important for um, communities who are used to having that ability to converse prior to getting down to business and scheduling in those breaks as needed as well. So I know I'm being mindful of time and our last slide is just giving you some information um, about our book, Missing Each Other. You can connect with us on our website missingeachother.com, where we also have videos of the different exercises that are available for free um, to be able to view and practice some of these exercises that we described. We also write for Medium and Psychology Today in terms of disseminating some of these ideas to um, specific areas of, um, you know, that make these ideas more practical and I think applicable to our everyday and you can always connect with us online as well. But we want to really thank you again for your patience and your own listening skills and hearing us um, and our, you know, our work and being able to talk to that with you and hope it felt relevant in different ways. I'm glad we have some time to open it up as well. Thank you. That was a terrific presentation and a great overview of material in the book and the concept of attunement, why it's so important. Let me ask a question first about the concept of 
people who are angry, many times in mediations, that ride up the elevator from the parking lots to whatever floor the mediation is, wherever it's happening, that's the most awful 45 seconds in the lives of the people who are riding up because they're their stomachs are churning, it reactivates thinking about all the events that led them to be parties to a lawsuit, many of them for the first time in their lives. And they come up and they're just as tense as can be. And they're just angry, just anger coming straight out of them. What's a good first step to take with somebody who is just exuding and spewing anger at you? Um, could I ask you a quick question? Are you talking about, do you have both of the parties that are angry at each other there at the same time, or are you going up with one of the parties? Is that well, if we see, I, I would say generally, if we see that they're really tightly coiled, we generally don't drop them into one room at the same time. Right. That's that's too, uh, in fact, too much of a conflagration. We need to do something to try to help people calm down in order to allow some dialogue to take place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I'll take a quick shot and see if Ashley has other thoughts. Um, number one, I think that um, this foundational first component of, of attunement, this relaxed awareness, if you are able to develop this in yourself, and, and we really recommend practicing this regularly, like setting aside, even if it's just five minutes a day to do that kind of breathing exercise that Ashley led us through, um, if you can do that on a regular basis and develop that skill, then um, when you're by yourself in a calm moment, then it's going to be a lot easier for you to implement that in a stressful situation. And so I would say, number one, as you're riding up on that elevator with that very angry person, if you can call upon your own relaxed awareness skills that you've developed and maintain a certain level of calmness, aware, aware of them, but yet calm yourself. Sometimes that is helpful to an angry person. It's, you know, sometimes if, if they're really emotional and angry, and then you get really emotional and angry, and then it's just sort of, you feed off each other and it builds, that can escalate things. So I think if you're grounded and stable, that in some ways can help to stabilize them. And second, the, the second thing I would say is that sort of like the listening component that if you if you're sort of grounded and stable but you're able to listen to them and really hear that they're angry and uh, appreciate it um, without getting super emotional yourself but it's a, clear to them that they're being listened to and they're being taken in then in some way I think that can help them like someone heard them you know someone is taking this in I think sometimes with angry people if they feel like they're not being listened to or they're being ignored or they're being blown off then they just get angrier, like no one's listening to me, you know? So I think just those two things in and of themselves, it's not gonna make them not be angry immediately, but I think it's gonna help the situation. Yeah, I would add, I think that validation is so important to being able to let someone feel heard, right? And seen, and I think if you couple that validation first with then a reminder of what those goals are for walking in and sort of reorienting to that and sort of just reflecting on that disconnect between the emotion and that next goal of this upcoming meeting and letting them sort of see how effective or ineffective that might be before moving in. But I think that validation piece first is what's gonna set you up for being most effective and then talking through the next step. What does the validation sound like? What, what are some things one might say to validate? I see oh. you're extremely angry right now. I hear that this is an incredibly difficult situation for you to be walking into. I understand from what we've talked about that you feel hurt and wronged. I mean, these are all examples, obviously, you can tailor to whatever you're talking about, but just labeling what you're noticing and what you're seeing. Um, you know, I think what we know in the psych literature is that labeling out loud can be a powerful form of that validation. Yeah, and I, Go ahead, I think that, well, well, yeah, I totally agree with Ashley. And I think a part of the, um, 
part of the challenge, I would think, as a mediator is that, um, you know, let's say this other person's angry and you are validating them in some sense, but you, um, you may not be able to, or you may not want to, or may not be appropriate to completely agree with them about everything or take their side, right? So as a mediator, you have to be, an, I guess, like a neutral party that's mediating between the two people. So I think this is the art of it, and this can be challenging is, so remaining grounded as much as you can, having that relaxed awareness, taking in, like listening to them and sort of validating, like hearing, okay, I hear that you're really angry about this and sort of in some ways indicating that their feelings are important, their feelings are legitimate, but, and that's the first thing, right? You don't have to rush to the second thing necessarily, but then the second thing would be um, to say like, even though I, to I totally appreciate and understand how you're feeling, I think it could be in your benefit to also consider this, or, you know, ultimately it might be more beneficial for you to, you know, so it's like, I think in that first step of being grounded and really taking them in and making them feel heard, they may, that may help them to then feel a little bit more open to hearing what you have to say and your suggestions for them or, or you know, but I think if, if they feel they're not being heard and they're not being appreciated, um, their point of view, then they may have a lot less openness to you and just engaging in the process of mediation, I would think. Before I rec thank you, before I recognize Elliot, I have one other question which is what if you just see somebody and it triggers something in you and you just don't like, them? you know, they remind you of your high school algebra teacher who was your nemesis or uh, Ted, you mentioned that you're a Chicago Bulls fan. Somebody shows up and they're wearing a Detroit Pistons, switch, <laughs> whatever. What do you, what do you do when they're, you've sensed something being triggered within yourself? Well, I think what you just said is the first step that I think is actually harder than we think sometimes is to notice that happening and to label that and to, to, to notice that feeling happening within yourself. Because I think what happens with reactivity is, um, you know, it's so fast, it can lead to us reacting rather than to responding and so one of the phrases we use in the book is this idea of minding the gap. If you all know the tube in, in London, the subway system that they have, the announcement always says minding the gap, to take note of that gap before you step. And we think about reactivity in a similar way of being able to, which I think takes practice over time is what you know our, our theme is, is that you're building that skill of being able to mind the gap to notice that reactivity coming up first, which then gives you the chance to being able to call on that relaxed awareness skill that we described to take that breath, to be able to note that maybe you need a second before walking towards and starting this interaction um, or taking a drink of water or whatever it might be that would regulate you. But yeah, I just don't wanna underestimate how difficult even just that noticing and that mindfulness can be sometimes. I agree. That's kind of what I was going to say too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Elliot, one of our stalwart regulars, great supporters of the Will Work for Food Project. Please. Hey, Matt, Jeff. Uh, I'm kind of uh, jumping on the question that you just asked with regard to implicit and explicit biases while we try to create the space for that type of anger. And my question is, at what point do we decide to withdraw from that situation before it becomes toxic, either to ourselves or maybe even to the angry person? Um, I got to believe at some point, I mean, if I was with Vladimir Putin right now, I think I'd have to leave the room within seconds. That's kind of what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think that's um, a really good point. I think that there is a point at which you have to stop. And um, it, um, 
and I guess this, I don't know exactly what the professional parameters are or protocols are for mediators, but um, uh, I would say off the top of my head that if you feel like, if you're in a room with two people who are in conflict and you're the mediator and you feel like it's just escalating in a um, non-constructive way and you know, essentially turning into a shouting match or an accusation match, and maybe you try to implement some things to rein it in or um, help people feel heard and calm it down and bring it back to a constructive discussion, but that's just, it's feeling futile in that moment that I think taking at least a break, you know, at least a 10 minute break for people to cool down and try to reapproach it makes a lot of sense. Maybe even breaking the meeting for that day and rescheduling for another time if people just can't have a constructive dialogue. I mean, that's my initial thought. Um, I don't know, Ashley, if you have any other thoughts. No, I think that's a tough one. And, and yeah, I've actually had similar thoughts and conversations here in the hospital in terms of what we do. And we have difficult situations where you just don't agree and you have a hard time bringing your whole self to that situation. But I think again, yeah, taking those breaks, being able to notice that, you know, I think if you're getting to the point where you're feeling like I am, I think I got to call it, um, you know, there might've been moments earlier that might've been lower level to that same uh, feeling, but, you know, building that, strengthening that ability to notice that earlier and earlier might be able to, gen you know, build in those breaks or build in those moments of pause um, earlier to sort of keep refilling refilling your tank in a way could be another way to think about it as well. It doesn't help when you're already at that end point, but for future situations. And one maybe quick thing I might add is just um, in an extreme situation, like Elliot mentioned, you know, like Vladimir Putin. So if you, if you had one party that was sort of like a Vladimir Putin or who you felt was, um, you know, not, not engaging in this mediation process in good faith, that they're just um, manipulating or sociopathic or something like that. I mean, again, I'm not a mediator or an attorney, so I don't know the professional parameters of this, but I would imagine there are certain extreme cases where a person is just not going to be able to engage in a constructive way in a mediation process. And that may be a different kind of setting, like maybe going to court, you know, with the traditional, you know, each person has their attorney and a judge or something is going to be a framework that's the only one that's going to work in that situation. But, you know, um, but I think in most situations, hopefully people are not really sociopathically manipulating and, and can actually, even if they have strong emotions and are angry, can get to a point where they can engage in a mediation process. Thank you. Greg Whitehair, you had your hand raised a moment ago. We have just a minute or two left, please. I know. And thank you. I love what you're up to. I think one of the biggest challenges, and it's more than two minutes can cover, is we are almost always jumping into separate rooms. And so while we as a mediator may have connection with our party, it's almost like tango partner one, then we go over tango partner two. Uh, are you going to use the flourish with your foot? Uh, tango partner one, uh, do you want to do a bend? or how? Do you, and then I'm trying to be all of that for everyone. How, how, do we, how do we ever break through that when we are doing that? Yeah, um, I think that's a really good question. I, yeah, I was thinking of mediation as more happening in one room with both people at the same time. So that's an interesting, um, I think, I, yeah, there's much more to say than one minute will allow, but I think being able to meet each person where they are in a different way, depending on the individuality of the person and trying to understand their point of view and where there might be a place where they could have some willingness to negotiate or overlap with the other person. Um, and using your kind of attunement skills to discern that and then bringing it to each of their attention so that maybe they could get to a place where they could meet each other you know, in a place of negotiation. That's maybe the best I can do. I don't know if you have any last thoughts, Ashley. Yeah, no, it just seems like, like the role, similar to the role of an interpreter or translator where, you know, as you build your awareness and understanding of, you know, each party, right, then learning how to 
transfer that to cult to um to translate that into a way that then will be received and understood by the other person. But it is, you know, a huge challenge to have that extra layer, like you're saying. Yeah. I admire what you all do because it's not easy. Yeah. <clears throat> and we admire what you do and everything that you <laughs> shared with us today. There are more questions. I'm very sorry that we don't have time for them. Perhaps people can contact you by yeah, absolutely. Additional questions that they may have. This was just a wonderful presentation. Edward Brodkin, Ashley Palatra, thank you very much. The book, Missing Each Other, well worth reading. I recommend it to everybody. It's been a wonderful episode of the new podcast.